Hello students and instructors and my name is Nate with Wi-Fi CFI and for this week and today's quick aviation training tip we are going to be covering inoperative equipment. Basically what we're going to talk about very briefly today is can you as a pilot go fly your airplane with something broken on board? One of the instruments or something else broken on the plane, can you take it? Can you go fly? Very briefly we are also going to be talking about how to do this with an MEL which I know a lot of small GA trainer aircrafts don't use MELs, but we will talk about it briefly and how to do this without an MEL. We'll also cover special flight permits for just a second at the very end. Before we jump into it, just want to let you know that this is a very small portion of our VFR or IFR airworthiness requirements lesson back on Wi-Fi CFI. In that lesson, we also talk about aircraft inspections, required equipment to be on board, airworthiness directives, all of those different things. So if you need to study up on those things, head over to wifi.cfi.com and again, watch either the VFR or the IFR airworthiness requirements lesson. All right, let's jump into it. Can we fly with inoperative equipment on our aircraft? Let's say something is broken. Can we go fly? The answer is maybe, it depends. Let's find out. Here's a bunch of different terminology that we're gonna go over real quick so that when we're talking about these different things, they're going to make sense. So you got deactivation, that's just to make a piece of equipment or an instrument unusable to the pilot or flight crew. Inoperative means that a system or its components malfunctions. The kind of operations list, this specifies the kinds of operations in which the aircraft can be operated. VFR day or night, IFR, icing, so on and so forth. The kinds of operations list also indicates the installed equipment necessary for that particular operation. This is going to be found in the pilot operating handbook, the POH. It'll tell you, your airplane is approved to fly VFR day, VFR night, and IFR. And then it might say something like, no flight into known icing, so you can't fly into known icing. And then it might say, in order to fly VFR at night, you've gotta have all of these things. And it, it might list, you know, equipment that you need to have, whatever. That's our kind of operations list, and it's gonna be found in your pilot operating handbook. Next, we've got our LOA, our letter of authorization. This is issued by the FISDO, the Flight Standards District Office, or your local FAA branch, and it authorizes an aircraft operator to use a minimum equipment list for their airplane. We're going to get into that. Actually, let's just get into it now, I guess. Minimum equipment, no, we're going to get into it in a minute, sorry. <laughs> minimum equipment list, we'll get into it in a minute. Then we've got our MMEL, so this is our master minimum equipment list. It contains a list of equipment and instruments that may be inoperative on a specific type of aircraft. The MMEL is type specific, like Cessna 172, type specific. MEL, the specific inoperative equipment document for a particular make and model by aircraft serial number and registration. The MEL is tail number specific, such as like November 736 Tango Bravo. It's tail number specific. It's specific to that exact airplane. Not just for the make and model, but for that exact airplane. STC, Supplemental Type Certificate, is a major change in type design. Not great enough to require a completely new type certificate or not enough to make it a completely new aircraft. And then we've already talked about our TCDS, our Type Certificate Data Sheet, a little bit earlier. It is the documents issued by the FAA that describe the aircraft's airworthiness requirements for a specific make and model. All right, that's a whole bunch of terminology. It's gonna make more sense as we talk about it. First, we've got our minimum equipment lists or our MEL. If you are an operator that has a letter of authorization, so a letter from the FAA that authorizes you or your company to use a minimum equipment list for your aircraft, then you follow exactly what that MEL says. In this situation, you would no longer follow the rules listed in FAR 91-207. Rather, you just do exactly what is said in your MEL. In other words, there's a lot of MELs out there for a lot of different types of airplanes. You cannot just be like, oh, well, I have the same airplane that uh, Bob down the street has, and Bob is using a, a, an MEL for his airplane. So I'm going to use the same MEL that Bob does. Can't do that. Can't do that. You may be able to, but first you have to get a letter of authorization from the FAA saying, okay, Tim, you can go ahead and use the same MEL that Bob is using, but you've got to have 
that LOA, that letter of authorization that approves you to do so. And that comes from the FAA. In other words, if you have this MEL, you no longer, you can throw eight tomato flames and flaps right out the window. Like the ones we were just talking about before this. The required VFR day and VFR night equipment, just chuck it. It is no longer relevant to you. Your new Bible is your minimum equipment list. You do exactly what it says. So if you have something inoperative on your airplane, you open up your minimum equipment list and you find out if you need it operating, if you can defer it, uh, what you need to change during flight, so on and so forth. In other words, here's an example of an MEL. It is for the weather radar system. It'll say repair category, whatever, so on and so forth. But this is the weather radar system. Do we need to have it on board? This would be probably for a bigger aircraft, but this is just what we're going to use, for example. How many are installed? So if we've got weather radar systems, the next category says how many are installed? Two of them. How many are required for you to go fly? Zero. There you go. I can go fly. But you also got to read the remarks and exceptions. And it'll have a big list here of what you got to do differently if you want to go fly without your weather radar systems working. All right. So you come in here, you find what it is, you find how many are installed and how many are required. If it says one installed, one required, then guess what? You're not flying if it's broken. All right, and then you follow whatever the remarks say. So it's pretty simple, but that is how minimum equipment lists work. If you have it, it that's what you do. You just follow exactly what this says. A lot of times small smaller you know general aviation trainer airplanes don't usually operate with minimum equipment lists you're usually going to be following the rules of a tomato flames or flaps but we like to put this out there because you might it is a possibility right? and when you get to the bigger aircraft and the jets that have more complex systems and have a lot of backups and this and that they use minimum equipment lists they don't use like a tomato flames or flaps All right, if you are operating an aircraft and you don't have an MEL, you are not authorized to use an MEL, then we're using a tomato flames and flaps again, or, and we're also gonna be using this flow chart here. Now this flow chart is actually from an advisory circular that's no longer active. It hasn't been active for a long time. However, the FAA hasn't really updated it or put out a new version of the advisory circular and so we still believe that this is a really good flow chart to go through to decide if you should or if you can go and fly your airplane with something broken and we're going to go through this flow chart here again it's from an advisory circular that was discontinued a long time ago but they haven't replaced it with updated language and so we still really like to use this we think it's a really good flow that's why we're using it Let's start right at the top. Number one, during the pre-flight inspection, the pilot recognizes inoperative instruments or equipment. We find something broken. Let's say, well, what should we use for our example today? Let's say it's our landing light. All right, we're going around, we flipped on the lights, we're walking around the airplane and we notice landing light's not working. All right, that's the first thing. Second thing is, then we ask ourselves, is the equipment required by the aircraft's uh, equipment list or the kinds of equipment operations list. So then we would have to look in the POH again. And if it says in the POH to fly VFR during the day, you have to have a landing light, then we're not flying, right? If yes, then the aircraft is unairworthy and you've got to fix it. So if in the POH it says you got to have a landing light, then you got to get it fixed before you go fly. If no, if we look in the POH and it's not there, it doesn't say on the kinds of operation list that we need a landing light, then we'll continue on. The next question is, is the equipment required by the VFR day type certificate data sheet, the TCDS? Then we would have to check the TCDS. Is it on there? If yes, we're not flying. If no, we go to the next question. Is the equipment required by an airworthiness directive? Maybe, we'd have to check the ADs. If it is, then we can't fly. If it's not on the AD list, then we ask ourselves the next question. Is the equipment required by 91205, 91207, so on and so forth? Again, we're using the example of a landing light and we're flying VFR during the day. 
A landing light is not part of a tomato flames. It is part of flaps. So to fly VFR at night, right, you gotta have a landing light if your aircraft's for hire. But our example is a landing light during the day. For VFR operations, no. If it is required by 91207 though, say it's the oil temperature gauge, you gotta get that fixed, you can't go fly. All right, but it's our landing light. So if no, the inoperative equipment must be removed from the aircraft or deactivated and placarded as inoperative. So you can go ahead and take your landing light out. Seems like kind of a pain. I like the or, or deactivated and placarded as inoperative. In other words, you can pop the circuit breaker, you can collar it for the landing light so that you know the circuit breaker is popped out. And then you put a little sticker maybe next to the landing light switch in the cockpit that says inop. That way we have deactivated it because we popped the circuit breaker and collared it. And then we put a sticker that says in op so that any other pilots that try to go fly know that the landing light does not work. Then after we've done all of these things and we've checked all of these things, at this point, the pilot shall make a final determination to confirm that the inoperative instrument slash equipment does not constitute a hazard under the anticipated operational conditions before release for departure. In other words, at this point, it's up to the PIC. Now the PIC can say, I feel comfortable going to fly VFR during the day without my landing light, or I don't, whatever, it doesn't matter. But at that point, it is up to the PIC. But it's only up to the PIC after we've gone through all of these checks. And then if we make it to step number six here, that we've deactivated it and placarded it then the pilot and command can make the final decision. And that is it for our quick tip today, but you already know where to go to get all of the best aviation tips and tricks, wifi.cfi.com on our website and on our mobile app, which you can download by following the instructions at wifi.cfi.com. You can get hundreds of hours of free content. We have a ton of tips and tricks like these. We have thousands of free flashcards, full length audio books, hundreds of free podcasts that you can listen to. So check it out, wifi cfi.com, and we will see you guys next week.